When you affect systematically the price of a financial benchmark that then the futures markets are also going to look into, that then swaps and options and all of the derivatives are going to be benchmarking against, then you have a ripple effect across the markets. To a financial economist, there may have been meaningful price differences that that cost somebody to gain a lot of money, but to the visible eye, potentially you would not be able to see a difference. The movements in prices have been largely driven by other market fundamentals and macroeconomic factors. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with the Miles Franklin Market Update, and with us today is Dr. Rosa Abrantes-Mitz. Now, Dr. Rosa Abrantes-Mitz is an expert in economic matters relating to collusion, market manipulation and fraud, and multi-sided platforms, as well as regulation, financial and commodity markets, and valuation. Over the course of her career, Dr. Abrantes-Mitz has provided testimony on behalf of governmental agencies, including the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Department of Justice, and private institutions in many areas, both plaintiffs and defendants. Dr. Brantismitz has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals, trade publications, handbooks, and mainstream media publications, such as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and Bloomberg. Dr. Brantismitz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Definitely. Now, what I wanted to discuss today is one of your specialties, precious metal manipulation. Now, there's been a lot of talk about this, especially since a lot of banks have settled in cases involving precious metal spoofing. Now, there's a lot of debate around this topic as well. Some people simply believe that these spoofing cases are isolated. And then some other people believe there's a grand effort to suppress the price of metals. Can you kind of take us through your research and kind of how do we understand precious metal manipulation? What is the fact and what is opinion or speculation? Sure. Um, let me give you a little bit of uh, background. Um, so I started looking into precious metals manipulation almost 20 years ago, but um, I got more strongly on it. Uh, around the time uh, that um, we were revising, we, I mean, worldwide uh, financial benchmarks such as LIBOR, and I came across some financial benchmarks, um, the London uh, gold and silver fixings, which I thought were set in a structure that made them very easy to be rigged. And so financial benchmarks are are prices if somebody asks what's the price of gold today people will tell you one price well the price of gold varies throughout the day but there's a particular time of the day where people do get together and set the price of the day and that price serves as reference for a lot of the trades for derivatives contracts for a lot of the things so that price is really important it's called a benchmark and i came across the way these were set um, and I found that um, having a very small, in one case three, in another case five, competitors uh, talking to each other live uh, without a record, uh, without anybody from outside monitoring that they were not potentially doing anything illegal, uh, and holding private information on the market interest, and be talking like that privately about uh uh, what prices? Of, what should the prices of gold and silver be? Um, I thought that opened the door uh, to rig prices, even if slightly sometimes. So that prior that I had about the deficiencies of the structure and the large incentive there was to move the price, even if you talk about one cent, you could potentially be talking about many millions of dollars in in damages or in illicit gains. Um, I then picked up the data, and this was 2013. And I started to notice that the vast majority of the days around the time those prices were set, prices went down. Now, this level of predictability of price movements is highly unexpected in an efficient market. Now, if, if 
from right now to the next minute, I could tell you with uh, high precision whether price of a particular stock is going to go up or down. Um, uh, that would signal a market inefficiency if I could do that so persistently because it meant there were gains to be made and participants were not taking advantage of them. So they would take advantage of them and those patterns would then, those opportunities would be eliminated. So the persistency of the price drops, the large price drops, the, the frequency of these price drops were highly suspicious. And so that led to um, investigations about whether prices were being uh, purposely um, suppressed around those fixings and whether that could have had more impact. Um, so that's one line of, of manipulation I have pursued. The spoofing cases you have mentioned are quite interesting. I have worked on those kinds of cases as well. There are a little bit of a different nature, um, and they're very difficult to detect um, from an outsider perspective like myself. As prices move randomly often. So if you see prices moving a lot at one time or a lot at another time, but you don't really have an anchor to, for example, what I told you earlier about the benchmarks I analyzed, I knew that this particular time of the day meant something. It meant the time at which prices were set for the day. And so prices behaving very strangely at that time had a potential meaning. Uh, when I look into a price series, for example, for gold and silver in futures markets, and I see they may be behaving strangely, uh, I cannot make up what may the reason be. Spoofing is a possibility, but there's many, many others. So what one, what does one need to have to look into these spoofing cases as an economist? We need to have what we typically do not have um, for an outsider, which is the communications. We need communications between uh, traders in which one of them, for example, says, hey, I want to help you lower the price. Um, and therefore, I'm going to put forward some offers to sell this product at a really low price that I never intend to execute. But that should lead the market into believing that prices should actually be lower. And by the time anybody is going to try and execute my trades, I just cancel them. And you may be able to actually buy the product at a lower price because I was able to influence the other market participants' views. Those cases are very hard to prove. Uh, they're hard to detect from the outside because obviously we don't have those communications. Uh, of course, there were just very large settlements uh, that came out on those cases. I, I assume that probably this type of what we call direct evidence of communications may have been strong. Um, but those tend to be, my experience is sporadic um, uh, episodes throughout a day. Uh, they may happen or not every day. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, while the type of manipulation I spoke earlier of financial benchmarks is potentially, in my view, much more persistent. And we know that to be the case because we uncovered LIBOR rigging, FX rigging, and a lot of other reading of the same type. A lot of people have pointed to that. If we look at I think it's around 3 p.m. London time that it seems like often precious metals fall. Now, this isn't always the case. I know just one of these weeks recently, we saw around 3 p.m. London time, we saw silver jump by about a dollar, gold jump by tens of dollars. So it, it sometimes goes the opposite direction, but people have pointed out that a lot of the time it will fall dramatically um, around that time. So you're saying that this looks like a different kind of manipulation, not spoofing, really. No, no. So this, this, uh, this would at least under the old regime, because what you are referring to the 3 p.m. London time is is the gold fixing um, a price for um, over the counter trading, and that has been reformed, I believe, 2015 because so many deficiencies as as uh, as i mentioned were uncovered they were so easy to be rigged and therefore was somehow restructured my view is that a lot of the restructuring does not address some of the core deficiencies and it, it may it may still be true 
that prices are being moved. And the, the reason is that, at least in the old times, prior to 2015, um, there were just a few market players who were essentially the financial intermediaries for everybody who wanted to trade spot gold. Uh, they knew everybody's positions and they knew they knew their clients' positions. They knew how much they were willing to sell, how much they were willing to buy at a particular moment in time. And they themselves were setting the price of gold. There was an auction um, and through the auction process, the price of gold was set, but the auction was private and only they participated. And there was nobody from the outside to ensure there were no conflicts of interest. And the banks themselves who were setting the price had positions on, on gold and on silver. So they, they themselves, aside from their clients, could have benefited from the direction going one way or another. Um, and, and they had the power to move prices, even if, though, even if slightly. I've seen some of those episodes of several dollars changes. Those were not the most typical. Sometimes it was much smaller. Uh, but it was clearly there to a much greater, greater extent than other times. And that is potentially a, a whole more, um, is, is a whole lot worse for the market overall because the spoofing effects tend to disappear very quickly. They involve one or another trader. Uh, you cause the effect right there. It, it disappears over time because it's very punctual, very, very episodic. When you affect systematically the price of a financial benchmark that then the futures markets are also going to look into, that then swaps and options and all of the derivatives are going to be benchmarking against, then you have a ripple effect across the markets. And so it is potentially much more damaging than, than spoofing. So it seems like what you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, is that there does seem to be, I mean, if we look at the things that have gotten to court and uh, the banks have settled on, those are spoofing. That's more episodic, as you're saying. Um, it's not going to have a long-term impact on price. But what you've looked into are these interesting price patterns we've seen around 3 p.m. London time that seem to possibly even have a longer-term impact on price, specifically suppressing it. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and there uh, there are cases um, going on right now and decisions being taken on those cases, so I don't think I should opine on those, but those are ongoing cases um, in the U.S. and I believe that in other parts of the world. Some people would argue, well, look at gold. We've seen such a rise recently. You know, gold went from $250 all the way to $2,000. Silver went from like $4 to $50 in 2011 and now you know, still doubled in the last um, last eight months or so. So some people argue, well, how could precious metals be suppressed if they've been rising so much? So the question is not that uh, manipulators would allegedly be stopping the rise. They may have slowed it down. And even if you're talking about 50 cents of price difference, when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of derivatives benchmarked against that price. And you have the power to move it. So not just in terms of magnitude, but directionally. You know ahead of time that I can make this price go down. And therefore, I'm going to position myself to benefit from that effect. And I know what to buy and I know what to sell ahead of time because I know the direction prices are going. So massive gains can be made and sometimes you know, at that moment in time, the effect may be quite small for each one of us individually. Maybe we only lost two cents on that trade. But on the other side is a big dealer, is a big broker. It are two or three or four big dealers or big brokers. And while for each consumer individually, the damage may have been small on one particular trade, we're talking about potentially very small price differences on large scale volume. And, and so on the side of the beneficiary of the manipulator, those gains could be very large. I do not believe from everything I have studied from these markets for a decade that that would have affected the overall price trend, but it would have slightly potentially affected, um, uh, have a, a little bit of a level effect that when you multiply by the number of transactions is, is potentially very large. 
So essentially what I'm hearing is that if there wasn't the manipulation and suppression over the last 10, 20 years, we still would be pretty much where we are today giving price. If you, if you look at that long of a term. To a visible eye, yes. Um, to a financial economist, um, there may have been meaningful price differences that, that cost somebody to gain a lot of money. Uh, but to the visible eye, potentially, you would not be able to see a difference. The, the, the movements in, in prices have been largely driven by other market fundamentals and macroeconomic factors. I think that's a really interesting point, because in that case, for the long term gold or silver investor, it doesn't seem like this price suppression really has has an impact on them. Well, it could have had. So imagine uh, that um, somebody was selling um, all of its gold position on one particular day when the financial benchmark was pushed very much down. Uh, they could have lost a lot of money on that day. And, you know, inversely, if they were buying, they could have bought for much less. Uh, but the gains in these uh, types of manipulations and, and law, big losses tend to be done on a, a very trade individual basis. So you, you move the price now and you gain a lot on particular contracts you get into, specific trades you do around that window of time, and then effects tend to dissipate. Then you do it again tomorrow. Uh, and then there's that localized effect again. So I agree with you that unless, unless you were to to want to be in the market at the second level, as a lot of people are, uh, you could take advantage of these opportunities, not necessarily manipulating, but understanding how the prices are and, and being able to profit from, from these things. But if you're taking it on the long run, you know, sometimes it may be too high, sometimes it may be too low. Um, I, I think that on average, across everybody, it, it may end up netting out. It's all about opportunity cost, right? If you can't be on your computer the entire time, the 50 cents that you may have saved per ounce on this trade may, may just not be worth to be sticking to the computer the entire time to monitor that. And how does this manipulation in gold and silver differ from manipulation in other markets? Manipulation is just so different. <laughs> the particular manipulation in, in gold and silver that I mentioned, the ones of the benchmarks, was very particular to those, in my view, to those benchmarks and to those markets, because out of so many years I've worked on these types of cases, I have never seen any benchmark that was set in such a highly deficient way that was so, at least theoretically, easy to rig for those being part of the group. Usually, these benchmarks are set, and LIBOR was another example as well. These benchmarks are set in a way that um, they're, they're set in a certain window of time, and when there's lots and lots of market participants, and if there are lots of them, it's very hard for one of them to be able to move, have an impact, uh, unless they're all colluding, which is what we found in some of these cases. Um, but manipulation can take so many different forms. Manipulation could be, for example, um, you know, FERC, um, on a case in which I testified on behalf of FERC, uh, BP was found guilty of natural gas manipulation, and part of the conduct showed in, at, at, in court was that um, natural gas was being transported from one location to another. Um, and the practical effect of that is that there was just too much supply of natural gas and prices were depressed that way. So you can play with prices only, you can play with quantities only. Um, there's many different ways you can play with a particular moment in time when you know it's easier to move prices. So there's many different ways in which these things can happen and I certainly have seen uh, many shapes and forms of manipulation. Now, I wanted to ask you about this particular issue because a lot of people uh, mention that there's there sometimes seems to be a divergence between the spot price and the price at which you can buy physical bullion. Sometimes, especially when the spot price goes down, 
the premiums for physical bullion go up and it's like, it seems like there's two markets. It seems like there's a paper market and there's a physical market. Do you see that in your research that there's, there's evidence for that, that it would be correct to characterize kind of two different markets, like a paper and physical market with respect to precious metals? I don't know that I would go as far to say that there are two different markets, but they are somehow different. There's a lot of paper outstanding per unit of gold. So the, the paper market is very, very large and is ever increasing. And so the more that happens, I think the larger the this link between what is really underlying it, the physical, the, the, the gold itself, and and how many pieces of paper you have floating around. Um, I have not addressed that issue specifically. I have noticed uh, instead in some of my research that there are often those links at particular moments in time between the spot price of gold and, and the futures uh, price of gold, which most of the time tend to very much follow in terms of movements, one follows the other. Uh, but there are moments in time when those uh, links get broken and they may be very temporary. And so those kinds of things can obviously have legitimate reasons. There may have been something that happened uh, that only affected particular traders in the futures market and, and, and not in others. Um, let me give you an example, a recent example, not in spot, not in gold or silver. Um, you know, we we saw, uh, you may, may recall, on April 20th, uh, WTI futures prices for oil went negative, almost minus $40 for the futures price of oil. And, and the spot didn't react at all that way. And it was just that one particular contract, and there weren't other contracts. And so that was an extreme example. But uh, there are examples like those where there's a huge temporary uh, break in between markets. And, and the role of an economist like myself is to analyze all possible situations and, and understand what legitimate factors could have contributed to that kind of behavior. And, and once all of those are ruled out, that, that's when um, you know, manipulation or fraud uh, becomes a, a plausible explanation. Do you think the the mechanism by which I guess the paper market or the the whole exchange works? Do you think that's the reason for these kinds of weird distortions in the price that we see oil at negative forty in the futures market, or is the way the system is built is that enabling distortions in the price? Well, um, no conclusion has yet uh, been set forward. Is my understanding on the oil episode, for example, but. I think that um, many possibilities, um, including manipulation, could justify what happened. I do think that um, algorithmic issues uh, and electronic trading and uh, you know programs that get um, programmed to, if the price hits a certain value, then um, sell everything or or. Uh, something of that nature, if, if there really aren't as many people in the market anymore when that happens, and so if the liquidity is low, you can find yourself in a downward spiral with massive impact and panic. I'm not saying that's necessarily what happened during the oil prices, uh, oil price drop, but um, I think the way trading is every time occurring more and more electronically, and everybody is um, basing their trading strategies pretty much off the same database. Everybody's stating data patterns. They all come up with their best pricing strategies based on the same information for the most part. And they pretty much program each other's algorithms with, if he does that, then I do that. Then sometimes what might happen is that we really enter into a downward spiral uh, and you see those massive spikes, sometimes high frequency trading or so. And people are like, oh, what's that? You know, price for gold just went up $20 and came down in two seconds. Uh, so I think to some extent that may be more a function of, of um, these algorithms. Now, potentially, some of them could be purposely um, programmed 
to cause that kind of kind of disruption, in which case that would be manipulation. But that is also very difficult, very difficult to discern because in order to prove that in court, you need to show intent, and and, and that's that's very difficult when you're talking about these types of algorithms. Yeah, and that's I think a very important distinction to make for our viewers is the isolated incidents of spoofing. There's been cases where those cases have been settled. So there's a level of certainty that that was actually occurring. Now, when it comes to these these arguments for that prices are suppressed sometimes around uh, the you know 3 p.m. and all these different times. Um, this that kind of if I'm hearing you right doesn't have the same level of certainty because it hasn't really gotten to court yet. Well, there have been two settlements in the U.S. Uh, Deutsche Bank settled um, four years ago or something like that or three maybe uh, on those allegations. Um, I believe last week uh, another bank settled. So there have been settlements and the settlements, as you said could be interpreted as a confirmation that something was ongoing, but it could also be an interpretation that, you know, I want out of these uh, because litigation is uncertain no matter what for each side. And, uh, you know, I just prefer to pay some some into it and get rid of all of the uncertainty. Um, but those cases are are all ongoing. So we we do have to see how they, they play out. Um, there were also some settlements in silver, I am aware, uh, a few years ago. On these cases of suppression of prices around the PM fixing, now there are no decisions. Um, these settlements are all private, private plaintiffs. Uh, my understanding is that there have not been any such settlements with uh, agencies. Yeah, and so you're saying there were settlements with respect to suppression in particular, or just price manipulation? Uh, the allegations in these silver and gold complaints are that prices were suppressed. Um, and those settlements are, so these are private class action lawsuits. And a couple of banks in gold have settled. I think others in silver have settled. But uh, there aren't the kinds of settlements uh, that, for example, J.P. Morgan just entered into a short time ago with uh, one of the U.S. agencies. All right. Well, Dr. Branchesmith, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your insight today. Very uh, interesting topic. There's so many different levels to it, and we just want to really bring everyone's perspective to it because it is such a such a complicated but also very controversial issue. People have different views on it, but um, I really appreciate your your expertise on this topic today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Definitely. And before we let you go, any last thoughts and where can people find you online? Well, I think that my main fi final thought is that even though I do this for a living uh, for two decades uh, on all sides, I work, I have worked for the U.S. agencies um, and also, you know, the, Fed, the FERC, DOJ and others. I've worked for plaintiffs and defendants. And you do find almost everywhere somebody who is willing to abuse the market. I am a big market believer. Most people are not out there to cheat on the market. Uh, and so even though this conduct does exist, and I tend to focus on it, the vast majority of the players play fairly. And um, I think markets are not perfect, but they are very, very superior to any other alternative. Awesome. Well, Dr. Branch Smith, that's, that's very uh, heartening to hear that we still have some level of free markets. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.